Welcome to Watchmen on the Wall, a daily outreach of Southwest Radio Ministries and SWRC.com. God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. Today, Dennis Cuddy concludes his series revealing the plans of the power elite. July is an extremely critical month for Southwest Radio Ministries, and friends, we're going to need your help. Historically, summertime giving is always slow, but this year giving is at a critical level. Unfortunately, we're having to further cut expenses, including reducing the number of stations we're on and laying off staff. In other words, we need your help. Please be praying for Southwest Radio Ministries and ask the Lord to provide the needed funds so that we can continue to proclaim the good news. And as you're led, would you please consider giving a gift to our summer relief effort? Your one-time and monthly gifts are needed. You can give when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. You can also give at our website, swrc.com. Thank you, friends, for your prayers and financial support. Now, here's today's host, Micah Van Hus. Welcome to the program today. I am your host, Micah Van Hus. I produce Marginal Mysteries here at Southwest Radio Ministries, where we talk about God's awesome universe and all the mysteries contained therein. If you want to check us out, we're at marginalmysteries.com, marginalmysteries.com, where you can get my latest book, Secret Societies. But today we are talking with Dr. Dennis Cuddy about his book, The Power Elite, Their History and Future. Now, Dr. Cuddy is a historian and political analyst. He has a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He has taught at the university level. He is a political and economic risk analysis. He's done it for an international consulting firm. He's a senior associate at the U.S. Department of Education, or was. He has written over 26 books and booklets and written hundreds of newspaper articles around the country. Dr. Cuddy, how are you doing today? Well, I'm thankful to be to be here, <laughs> given that uh, horrific truck accident I had. I just thank God for what I do have. Yes, sir. So today we're going to talk about your book, The Power Elite. The history of The Power Elite goes back almost a thousand years, does it not, Dr. Cuddy? That's correct. And how have these power elite used politics, the economy, and societal manipulation to implement control? Control is the, the key word. They have various plans and individuals placed in advance to execute what they need. You might uh, say that economics is a big part of it. So I begin the book with the Knights Templar, who really, I guess you could call them the first bankers. You know, not in terms of banking as we know it today. But what happened is we had come out of a feudal system. About a thousand years ago, we had feudalism. That's like, you know, Robin Hood, (laughs) Mm -hmm. days of feudalism, and King John, and so forth and so on. He, King John, not not King Richard, he went off to the Holy Land as part of one of the Crusades. There were seven Crusades. They had five, which were generally the Knights Templar and others, and then they had one woman's crusade and one children's crusade, fighting uh, Muslims and the key Muslim at the during that time was the Saladin, or they call him Salahud. And there's a very good motion picture, I forget the name of it, which uh, handles that subject very well. What happened was they would come to the Holy Land to protect it from the Muslims, right? An assault. Take back, and it's back and forth. We, uh, I don't know what to say, we, meaning the, the West and Christianity, we'd win one, and then the Muslims would win one. They, and then we win one, and then we kick them out, and they kick us out, and back and forth, and back and forth, like that. And so uh, the Knights Templar were the main military force helping to preserve uh, the Holy Land. The um, other side, the Muslims were very intelligent in, in their operations. I won't go into it because it's really horrible what they did sometimes. They, they were very bloodthirsty types there. So what happened was, they would be doing okay. The Knights Templar would be preserving. Unfortunately, people away from their home for a long time might sort of slip in terms of the morality. Mm-hmm. And so what happened was the 
Muslims, Salahuddin and all, would attack. And they would pray. They would pray, the Christians would, for God's grace and so forth. But there was a fellow who was recording these events there, recording the battles and so forth. And he, he would write that God is not protecting them because they were engaged in a lot of immoral sex and so forth. So they tried the Templars and the, their women and their wives and so forth there to do all kinds of... The women would go to Golgotha and they would shave their heads doing all kinds of things and praying and praying and praying. But the person who recorded these events said, God's not listening because they, they were not moral. They, didn't, they weren't loyal to him. They weren't continuing in their obedience. And so, you know, they just lost. And it was, most of the time it was just bloody and violent, so forth and so on. So Philip of Spain got the idea, and he had to get the approval of the Pope at the time to just sort of make up some charges against the Knights Templar whose leader was Jacques, uh, Jacques de Millet. Mm -hmm. And in uh, 1313, they decided, uh, let's just kill old Jacques. What they didn't understand is the Knights Templar weren't stupid. They had dispersed secretly, secret places. And not all of it has even been discovered today where they hid their money. Jacques de Millet is accused of uh, worshiping Satan and so forth and so on. And some of them did. Some of them actually did. Now, de Millet confessed, but he was forced. When he was getting burned at the stake, he said, well, I'm just going to tell the truth. He yelled out, he said, I did not forsake my Christian God and Lord. I remain true. He just wanted his last statement to be sure that the people knew that it was under duress, his torture, that he admitted these, uh, these nasty things that had been done. Okay, now, Proceeding along through the history and future, I bring it quickly up to modern, well, not modern time, the early 1800s. And what happened in the early 1800s is the British are very, very powerful. And don't forget the Dutch. Historically, the Dutch are far more powerful historically than they are today. But at one time, they were very powerful, and it's called the House of Orange. And you can look online, newsreviews.com. I have a two-part article, you just type my name in, Dennis Cuddy and then House of Orange, and you can see their power that they've had over the years. And so 200 years ago, 1809, the British are still trying to get us under control. So like I said before, the, I have a letter from the emissary to uh, the U.S., and he's uh, writing a letter to his friend in uh, Massachusetts and saying we're going to use abolition as an act to regain control of the country, you know, it's sort of divide and conquer, you know, like that, it will divide the nation. And so the idea was that they would join the 11, separate the 11 deep south states and join them with Mexico and uh, the Caribbean islands to form uh, a, what they call the Gulf Empire. These are their words where unlimited Negroes would produce unlimited cotton and cheap, you know, from cheap labor and so forth, like that. And that's uh, one of the things that whoever wins history is able to write it, you know, to their, to their advantage. So what would happen is the North wrote histories so that you have the evil South and the virtuous North. Well, I'm very glad, most people are glad, slavery is ended, that that's a good thing. But it, it was not the, the virtuous, the virtuous North is a, is a big joke, because North, slavery actually existed longer in the North than in the South. And what would happen, and there was a, um, not long ago, there was a, well, in the 1950, there was a reunion of the last survivors of the Civil War, the Civil War. And the black soldiers from the North hated the Northern soldiers, the white. They hated the North. You, you won't hear that in, you know, your average history class. Well, because the Northern soldiers, white soldiers, when they went into the South, massively raped black women. Now, try and find that in a history book. But that's, that's the accurate situation. But see, they, they won, so they can just sort of eliminate or not include that. In the, in the writing. So what would happen is, logically, if uh, the South has seceded during this, this time in 1861, the South seceded, they have no opposition. The North has no opposition. So Lincoln and his friends in the North 
could have ended slavery like that, you know, just like instantaneously. But they didn't. Why? Because those northern textile mills, like my father was from Massachusetts, and he worked at Pacific Mills, and his father worked at Pacific Mills. Those northern textile mills benefited tremendously over cheap, slave-picked cotton. So th this idea of the vir virtuous North is, is a farce. Now, I'm not saying the South is pure, because like I said, slavery is an evil, and we don't want slavery. But you have to remember only 13% of the Confederate soldiers had a slave. Only 13%. Planter class. You know, the, the sitting, you know, Colonel Sanders sitting on the veranda with his mint julep and, you know, like that. So the, the situation that has been presented often is misrepresented. Misrepresented. Most Southerners, most Southerners, Confederate soldiers were out there slopping around behind the mule and working their fanny off, you know, getting potatoes and so forth. And well, I, we won't spend a lot of time on that. But through the history and future, you have the power elite writing history to present themselves as noble and, and so on, very, very noble. But oftentimes they weren't noble at all. All right, now, what they had is a dialectical process was the, the mechanism that the power elite would use. And I mentioned that in the, the previous program because you have Marx and then Fanny Wright, Madame Francoise, Darius Mont, and they wanted to have the Smithsonian and so forth and so on. Eventually, to have a world socialist government. But, uh, you know, as I said, you have to be, you have each nation socialist first. Then, we'll come on up to today. I'm, I'm moving along so we get to today. You would have people like myself and others. We knew, we understood that the UN was not good. The UNESCO, for example, the UN's education arm, education social, and so forth and so on, was not good. It really wasn't. They would do all kinds of things. And so we urged President Reagan, I was in the Reagan administration, to get out of that thing. They were not doing things. The, the education that they were using was going to make us worse off, not better off. And so what happened was that we got them out. But then when George H.W. Bush came in, his secretary of education was Rod Page from Houston. And he said, we want to tell you we are pleased <laughs> to be rejoining UNESCO. Now, why is that bad? Because one of the concepts that the Illuminati had, to, the Illuminati had people who would have specific assignments. And so one of them in the Illuminati would to be make people citizens of the world. We want them world citizens. So Rod Page said, we're so glad to be joining UNESCO because once again, We'll make our kids citizens of the world. Why is that bad? Because the, you're a resident of the world. You're an occupant. But a citizen, citizen means you have legal obligations. Now, if you have a legal obligation as a citizen of the world, that supersedes your obligation as a citizen of the U.S. So that comes first, your obligation to citizen of the world, not your obligation to our Declaration of Independence and the government that we had established, 10 uh, Bill of Rights and so forth. It sounds like a small thing, it's just a matter of words, but words have consequences. All right, now, in the Illuminati, you had, and this is another chapter in my book, you have Citizen Genet. Now, he has come out of the French Revolution, right? And the first part of the French Revolution is, you know, sort of understandable freedom. But the second part is a real bloodbath. And Citizen Genet was sent by them, by the uh, French uh, revolutionists. The, the Illuminati had infiltrated the Masonic lodges to Russia. Now, the Russians aren't stupid. You know, Catherine the Great, they're not dummy. So they don't stay there very long. And so they're kicking him out. And he comes down into Charleston, which is a big Masonic town, Charleston, South Carolina, and works his way up through the Carolinas to uh, Pennsylvania, where he foments the Whiskey Rebellion. You may remember that from your history lessons, junior high and so forth, the Whiskey Rebellion, right? We're having a very difficult time. Now, Jefferson's overseas. He succeeded Ben Franklin as our emissary to France. So he doesn't think anything wrong is going on. But when he gets back here, John Adams writes uh, him a letter and he says, listen, Thomas, 
you weren't here, but we almost lost our country when the Capitol was in Philadelphia. There were 10,000. Now, 10,000 people today is a big deal. Can you imagine what 10,000 people were back then? Mm. They were surrounding the president's residence, and they were going to kick him out. We would have been gone. No United States would have been gone. Not in existence. Uh, what happened was uh, Washington had his secretary of state, Thomas Jefferson, write a letter to Jefferson saying, Mr. Secretary Thomas, you know, you've got to tell Janae to get out of here. Stop doing this stuff because he's creating a lot of mischief. And they tried to sneak it all through by saying, oh, we're just democratic society. See, that sounds good, right? Just a bunch of democratic society types. So what I did was I asked the Librarian of Congress to send me a copy of an 1802 book, a very rare book, I think maybe on one or two in existence, and I placed it on a table, and I put the oath of the democratic society on the table, and I put it right next to the original oath of the Bavarian and Illuminati, and they were same. the same. So that shows they were identical. These uh, so-called democratic societies were the, really the Illuminati types trying to take over the U.S. And so what would happen then is these societies were um, sort of working. They had dispersed. The, the Illuminati had been discovered. But Adam Weishaupt, who founded the Illuminati, said, I have already planned for this. I'm already here. So what he did was they dispersed. Some went to uh, Paris and the Prison Outlaws League. Some went to Sweden and a couple of other places. They dispersed their members. I just personally, I haven't got any documentation for this, but I just personally think this was a time when there were no airplanes and no cell phones. And that guy, Weishaupt, got together a lot of really powerful people too fast. You know, too, they had a Catholic cardinal, a lot of really prominent people. So I th I'm very suspicious that this hadn't been planned way before 1776, way before that these, this thing was going to be planned. In 1798, if you look at it, something on the Library of Congress, it's called American Memory, and you can see the actually handwritten letter, and I put this in some of my books, the uh, handwritten letter from George Washington to a Reverend Snyder. And Reverend Snyder, 1798, says, Mr. President, do you know that the Illuminati is here? And George responds, yes, I do know that they're here. I do know. So George was uh, on the ball there, thankfully. So we did not have more of an effect from these democratic societies, meaning Illuminati. Now, another type part of my book that de deals with you have to prepare a people to be taken over. So they would do this using music and dance and so forth. But generally, we'll call them psychological conditioning. There's a chapter on psychological conditioning. And I won't go through all of this, but one of the key people for this would be Edward Bernays. Bernays was the uh, nephew of uh, Sigmund Freud. He became the chief advisor with CBS. CBS Network was just starting in, 18, in 1928. And it was just starting then. He was, became their chief advisor. And he also wrote a book called Propaganda in that year. And he says, we have the ability to psychologically control you without you even knowing about it. The techniques are so sophisticated. And not just chemicals, but just psychological techniques. They would have, let's say, verses set to music and repeatedly intoned. So when I go up the street to one of these shops, that's what you hear. Verses set to music and repeatedly, repeatedly intoned. They would use against Noriega. Noriega, who had tried to hide out at the Vatican Embassy when we were trying to get him. And they, they would pound loudly through speakers uh, verses like, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. You know, psychologically pounding his uh, consciousness with that. And people in, people in general, they, they would do that in these stores all over the place. Misdirection is another thing you would have done. Uh, but before I leave Bernays, let me give one example of how, how he operated. He was uh, given a contract to increase the sales of tobacco, cigarettes, by getting women to smoke. Women generally didn't smoke. Men were smoking, but women didn't smoke. What they wanted to do is make women as dumb as, <laughs> dumb as men are, smoke. What he did was he knew that women were interested in 
fashions, you know, fashion, latest fashion. So he went to the garment district in New York City and paid them a lot of money to make red and green the fashion for the next year. And so what happened was Lucky Strike Tobacco had a white pack with a red bullseye, and they were going to make menthol, you know, softer, milder for women, with a green bullseye. And so they introduced that the menthol, and it went over like gangbusters, you know. So women started smoking, smoking, smoking these Lucky Strike menthol cigarettes. He also, and we don't have time to go into it, but he later on was manipulating people to get fluoride in the water. He, they would say, oh, it's just, you know, sodium fluoride, when it really, they really knew it was hydrofluoric salicylic acid, which narcotized, I mentioned that in the previous program, narcotizes part of the brain. And, you know, think about what that does. Think about your brain. Most, most cities in the nation have hydrofluoric salicylic acid. Think about narcotizing the brains of Americans. Just, just think about that, the consequences of just doing that one thing. And see, you know, after a while, you think about it and say, my word, we've, we've had it. All right, so now the next, another chapter in the book is uh, the Oklahoma City bombing. Mm-hmm. And there's a, uh, a fellow named Craig Roberts, who's a buddy of mine, and he was a Tulsa a policeman, and he was invited to come over because they really couldn't trust the Oklahoma situation. You know, there are certain things that were going on, like the, they were, had dog teams sniffing around before it opened that day. Now, you got to wonder what, who told them to do that. And there was, I think, a young black officer who one of his friends, Craig Roberts, found dead out in the field because he was getting this information. I also included uh, Jana Davis. And she was a friend of mine, and she has come from Texas. And she said, I've just gotten back from Arkansas because I'm thinking the Clintons are involved in some of this stuff somehow. Well, the powers that be, they, they don't like that. They don't like you sniffing around too much. She suddenly and mysteriously developed an illness and just dropped out of sight, you know, suddenly and mysteriously. And so she just, she just left the investigative team. So you can imagine what they, they, they didn't want her sniffing around because she said, listen, the only difference between me and a pit bull is lipstick. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. But then she, she had to quit because they did something to her health. I'm not sure exactly what, but you know, they have all kinds of mechanisms to this stuff. They would falsify records. The bomb was, uh, well, the bomb was developed at Elohim City, and later on they found out that half of the People at LOM City, those the skinheads who were making the bomb were actually FBI informants. FBI informants reminds you of that uh, bombing of the World Trade Center, where the guy who's making the bomb goes to his FBI contact and says, "Give me some fake material." And the guy said, "No, use the real stuff." And nothing happened to that guy. Nothing happened to him. He wasn't fired or anything. Just nothing happened to him. We are not very nice. We are not very nice to others, and we're not very nice to our own people many times. Elohim City was a center for that. Well, you'll find a lot of interesting stuff, like Andreas Strassmeyer, Timothy McVeigh went over to Germany and was stationed there where Andreas Strassmeyer was for about, about two weeks or so before he came back, right? And he's supposed to be the one leading the bombing effort. And they, then it's just like saying people who had died, like Bormann's dead and Himmler's dead. No, everybody's dead. Don't worry about the Nazis. They say, no, don't worry about it. Timothy McVeigh was executed. But I put at the end of my chapter on the Oklahoma City bombing, I put down there that there was a Chicago news anchor. She shows up that night at a news desk and says, hello, I was one of the few people invited to witness the execution of Timothy McVeigh. And right at the end of her announcement, she says, I didn't know your chest still moved up and down after you were dead. <laughs> See, your chest doesn't move yeah. up and down. So Timothy McVeigh really wasn't executed. He was just, just plopped somewhere. It's like uh, Osama bin Laden. If you go to Dearborn, Michigan, don't be surprised if you run into <laughs> Osama bin Laden walking around out there somewhere. Kind of like Argentina Adolf Muslim Hitler now. down in Argentina. Yeah, Argentina, yeah. Money talks. Money talks. The, one of my chapters is on the Muslim Brotherhood. And pay attention to who the connections are there, like Huma Abedin, who is Hillary's right-hand woman. Her mother 
and her brother all were either with the Muslim Brotherhood or you know, the women's part of the Muslim Brotherhood. So there's a real connection between our government in its terms of Clinton and Hillary Clinton and the Muslim Brotherhood. Things like that will appear, and that makes you wonder how the people who got the ambassador in Libya, how they got to his safe house so fast. Think about that. Think about it. And he was about to be called back to America to testify. Perhaps Hillary didn't want him to testify. He might reveal some stuff. So anyway, look uh, very carefully. And there's uh, indexes. Check your indexes as well. Folks, you've been listening to Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Fascinating topic about the power elite. If you are interested in getting Dr. Cuddy's book, The Power Elite, Their History and Future, you can do so at Southwest Radio Ministries. That is swrc.com, swrc.com, or by calling 800-652-1144, 800-652-1144. Dr. Cuddy, it's been a pleasure talking with you these three days and uh, fascinating topics. Thank you very much. Glad to be there. The complete three-day radio presentation from Dennis Cuddy on the Power Elite and their plans is now available in its entirety on CD. Order your copy today when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. This week, Southwest Radio Ministries and Watchmen on the Wall is featuring the Dennis Cuddy Collection of Resources. Choose from the six excellent books that we have in stock from Dennis Cuddy. This collection of researched insight and analysis includes the titles Conspiracy 1 and 2, The Power Elite, Their History and Future, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, The Road to Socialism and the New World Order, and finally, Mental Health, Education, and Social Control. Order these books and you will be informed on the Power Elite's ultimate plan for a world socialist government. Order these Dennis Cuddy titles today when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. You can also order these books on our website, swrc.com. Based on his years as a political and economic risk analyst, historian, and senior associate with the Department of Education, Dennis Cuddy's books delve deeply into the plans, plots, and schemes that are changing the culture, the country, and the world. Make sure you order Dennis Cuddy's books today when you call 1-800-652-1144. Watchman on the Wall is a production of Southwest Radio Ministries and is supported by faithful friends like you. Please visit our website, swrc.com.